Good morning, everyone. Is on? Oh, no. Good morning, everyone. Is it on? Oh, no. Is it on? Good morning. On. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to Kirkpatrick. I hope you've had a lovely weekend, finally enjoying some sunshine in Northern Ireland. My name is Emma, and I'll be leading our service of worship this morning. I'm a member here at Kirkpatrick. If you're new or visiting this morning, you are especially welcome. And a particular welcome goes out to the McGee and Johnston families who are here celebrating Bodie and Seth's baptism. Creche is available um, through the double doors. There, someone will direct you um, if you need it. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 119, verses 36 to 37. Listen out for how we should be orientated according to the psalmist. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. In our busy day-to-day -day lives, it's all too easy to fill our minds with distractions, to-do lists, selfish ambition, and lose focus of the one who is most important. One of the great things about setting aside this time together on a Sunday morning is that it helps us to focus our hearts on God. But even then, if we're being totally honest, it can be hard to leave the distractions behind and turn our attention to him. So as we come to worship now, let's ask God to turn our eyes and our hearts from everything else going on and orientate ourselves firmly towards him. Let's sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
Let's pray together now. O oh God, help us to fix our eyes on you, on your word, on what matters most of all. Turn our eyes towards all that is pure and right and excellent and praiseworthy. We pray that you'd help us to turn our eyes to you, to the one who alone is worthy. God, you are the only one who is holy and exalted and worthy of praise. You're the one who has power over everything. You do great and awesome works. You're exalted, high, and lifted up. We worship you. Lord, we know we fall short. The things of this world so easily distract us and trip us up. Many times this week, our focus was not on you, but firmly on ourselves. God, help us to live with our eyes fixed on you. Help us to live out what it says in Hebrews 12, fixing our eyes on Jesus today, the author, perfecter of our faith. Give us life in your ways, in your word, and that which is worthy of our attention, of our focus, of our eyes. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy towards us. Amen. Well, as Emma has already said, it is a joy to welcome uh, families uh, of Bodie and Seth who are coming uh, to bring them for baptism this morning, and friends and family, uh, all of the McGee and Johnson families, you're so welcome with us this morning. I did want to mention uh, at this point as well, though, that these are actually not the only baptisms that are happening today. Um, three of our young people, uh, Alexa Donaldson, Reese Donaldson, and Martha Woolsey are being baptized on profession of their own faith this afternoon at 3 p.m. at Helens Bay Beach. Um, so if you're around Helens Bay on a lovely afternoon, and it might be busy, uh, so if you're around Helens Bay on a lovely afternoon, uh, look out for us uh, and join us as we celebrate those baptisms this afternoon as well. I'm going to invite uh, the families to come to the front just now. So uh, Ben and Carly, Austin and Edison and Bodie and Philip and Ashley, and Martha, and Saul, and Seth. If you want to come up to the front uh, just now, and just join me here. After his death and his resurrection, and before his ascension into heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ gave a commission to his disciples. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. The Lord Jesus himself was baptized by John in the River Jordan, and his disciples baptized those who believed in Christ. Baptism is a symbol of our identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Through his death on the cross, we find forgiveness for our sin. By his resurrection, we have new life in which we are called daily to walk. Baptism is for believers and for their children. Paul told the jailer at Philippi, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And he and his family were then baptized. In baptism, Christian parents acknowledge their responsibilities under God's covenant of grace to provide a Christian environment for their families. And they recognize that it is only as God works by His Spirit in their lives that their children will come to saving faith in Christ. We come in prayer together. Let's all pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you this morning with hearts full of gratitude for all of your good and precious gifts to us. We are astounded afresh at the wonder of your creation. We thank you that you made us in your image and you made us to enjoy relationship with you. Thank you for your son, our savior Jesus, who came into this world as a baby, who grew through childhood and adolescence to adulthood for us. Thank you for his death on the cross for our sin for his resurrection from the grave that brings us victory 
and hope. Thank you that he ascended into heaven and sits at your right hand even now and will return to bring us home. We pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would continue to make us more like Jesus. We pray that Bodhi and Seth and their families would come into real and living relationships with you. We pray that their parents would be blessed with wisdom and understanding as they seek to bring their children up in a Christian environment. And we pray for ourselves as a congregation, as a church family, that you would give us grace to fulfill our vows here this morning. Forgive us the failures of the past and bring us back into close relationship with you that we might walk with you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can I ask the congregation, please, to stand? And so in presenting Bodhi and Seth for baptism this morning, you as parents are asked to reaffirm your own faith and promise to provide a Christian upbringing for your children. And so I ask you the following questions. Do you confess your faith in God, your Creator and Father, in Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord, and in the Holy Spirit, your sanctifier and guide? And do you promise, depending on Christ's help, to teach your children the truths of the Christian faith, to set a godly example in your home, and to bring them regularly to public worship so that they may come to acknowledge Jesus as Savior and Lord. And to the congregation here this morning, as a family of God's people here in this place, we have responsibilities in the care and upbringing of our children in this congregation. So I ask you to answer the following question. Do you who now receive these little ones into the fellowship of Christ's church, promise to so order your congregational life and witness that they may be continually surrounded by Christian example and influence. May God give us all grace faithfully to fulfill these promises. Seth and Bodhi, for you, Jesus Christ came into the world. For you, he lived and showed God's love. For you, he suffered the darkness of Calvary and cried out, at last, it is accomplished. For you, he triumphed over death and rose to newness of life. And for you, he ascended to reign at God's right hand. He did all this for you, Seth and Bodhi, though you don't know it yet, that you may come to know him and love him and follow him and trust him and find eternal life through him. Seth, John, Albert, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest on and remain with you always. read, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest on and remain with you forever. Both these children are now received into the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, and are engaged to be the Lord's. We sing together the words of the ironic blessing. The Lord bless As you grow as a family in your face, we want to present you these Bibles um, for you to read. You probably have some of these in the house already, I imagine.
But these are for Bodhi and for Seth. Um, these are their Bibles. Uh, and you can take the time to read them to them and help them as they grow together in their faith. So I think I've given you each the right one. Uh, we're going to sing together now as our children go out to Sunday Club during this song. We're going to sing together, Speak, O Lord. Just before our scripture reading and sermon, I want to make a quick announcement about Elevate. Elevate starts back today and it's for all young people in years 11 and 12 at school. We meet in the vestibule immediately after the sermon, so at the back of the church, front of the church, whatever, and before heading to the offices upstairs, we split up into small groups and take some time to discuss the sermon and answer any questions that our young people may have. So if you are a young person or parent of a young person who is in year 11 or year 12 this year, um, please um, follow us out into the foyer directly after the sermon. Myself, Philip Gilpin, and Steve Skinner will be there to meet you. So now for our scripture reading. It's on page five of our Pew Bibles, and I'd encourage you to have that open in front. So Genesis 3, page five of the Pew Bible. Now 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you, you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Amen. Good morning, my name is Francine and I'm the assistant minister here this morning and I will be talking to you a little bit about Genesis chapter 3. But before we do that, let's pray. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Da, 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 da. How many of you now have a picture of Darth Theatre in your head? Hands up. 
if you have an image of Darth Vader. Goodness me, I thought there'd be some more of you. Well, if you have watched the early Star Wars movies, then you will know that that tune is a warning of the imminent appearance of Darth Vader. Music plays a vital role in the things that we watch, giving clues and indications to the plot line and often signaling what's about to happen next. My youngest son is a great Doctor Who fan, so much so that we have shelves of DVDs, ranging from the very first Doctor in the 1960s through to the more modern ones. Jake, being a musician, is kingly interested in the music within Doctor Who. He can recognize each of the Doctor's themes, yes, they all have a tune assigned to them. Who knew? He can pick out even the smallest parts of the melodies, which then give him clues to what is happening in the storyline he is watching by referencing other parts of the Doctor's history and helping him to understand the plot and how it's all linked together and interconnected. Jake watches this program through the lens of Doctor Who, bringing together all his knowledge and understanding of it to help him interpret it and make sense of what he's watching. I watch and enjoy the program on one level. Jake watches and enjoys the program on a completely different one. And so it is the same when it comes to reading the Bible. There are many who read the Bible on one level, learning about God, hearing him speak to them, gaining an understanding of the gospel story. But because they don't know all of the melodies, which give them signposts to help them understand the message, confusion, misinterpretation, frustration sets in when they have difficulty understanding what they are reading. When we don't know the melodies that flow throughout its pages, signposting us to stories of the past and stories yet to come, we're unable to comprehend the deeper levels of the passage. So in order to do this, we must put on the lens of the ancients to make sense and interpret correctly what we're reading. The ancient Jewish life revolved around the Torah. Their seasons were marked by the festivals found in its pages that celebrated and remembered God's provision to them. The boys' education was based on it. Their fireside stories came from it. They intimately knew every nuance on every scroll. If we can imagine the Bible as a symphony, Genesis 1 to 11 introduces us to all the melodies that we will hear in full or in part again and again and again throughout the scrolls of the Torah. They flow into the New Testament, linking it to the old, and the symphony, well, it climaxes in Holy Week and triumphantly ends in Revelation. Today's reading introduces us to one of the major themes in the symphony, found throughout the entire scriptures, the theme of the fall and God's restoration. Last week, we left Adam and Eve, God's image bearers, living in perfect harmony with God, with each other and creation. Today, we will be looking at the destruction of those perfect relationships and taking a closer look at the melodies that resulted from the fallout of Adam and Eve's disobedience. In chapter three, a new character is introduced into the story, the serpent. There's an element of mystery surrounding him, but we are given some details. Genesis 3 begins, 
Now the serpent was craftier than any of the wild animals the Lord God made. So in this verse, we learn three things. One, he's craftier than all the other animals. Two, he is a wild animal. And three, he was created by God. So let's look at each of these in turn. In the version of the Bible that we read this morning, it said that the serpent was crafty. But not all versions use that word. In fact, the Hebrew word achum has been translated in other versions to mean subtle, clever, cunning, intelligent, sneaky, all of which are correct. Ahum, within another book of the Bible, Proverbs, means that the person values knowledge, planning how to use it in achieving their objectives. They don't believe everything that they hear, and they know how to avoid trouble and punishment. In these verses, Ahum has been translated as prudent, meaning acting with or showing care and thought for the future. Ahum, therefore, is a morally neutral word. It doesn't intrinsically mean evil or good. The serpent has been given the gift of Ahum above all other animals. But he chooses to abuse that power for his own selfish ends. Secondly, we're told he's a wild animal. He does not belong in the garden. He should be outside of its walls, yet here he is right in the middle of the garden. And what were Adam and Eve told to do regarding the animals? Rule. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. They should have banished it from the garden. Yet here is Eve listening to it. Thirdly, it's a creature that God has made. But it's a creature that has free will. Free will as to how to use the given gift of a room. Remember that I said a room is a morally neutral word. It can be used for good or evil purposes. And the serpent chooses to use it to get what he wants. Only two of God's creatures are given free will. Humans and angels. So although the passage is not openly explicit, we are to understand that the serpent is a manifestation of a heavenly being who's out to manipulate the humans, to take from them the right to rule the earth, and as far as he's concerned, ruin God's plans while doing it. He's used his own free will to rebel against God. And as the story unfolds, and as this melody flows throughout the pages of the Bible, it becomes clearer and clearer who exactly he is. Satan. The serpent's conversation with Eve leads her to use her own free will to eat the fruit, to give some to Adam, and using his own free will, he eats also. From that moment, everything changes. The perfect relationships that we saw in the garden last week are destroyed. As soon as they have eaten the fruit, they realize they're naked. Their nakedness had never bothered them before. At the end of Genesis 2, we are told, and the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. By eating the fruit, something shifted in their relationship, making them regard each other differently. Not only did their physical nakedness make them uncomfortable, but they're now also wary of each other in a way that's never existed before. The ability to be vulnerable 
before each other has gone. Shame has entered the human story. Shame is a powerful emotion that can destroy relationships if it's left unchecked. It's described in the dictionary as an uncomfortable feeling of guilt because of your own behavior or someone else's bad behavior. Many of you know that I grew up in Kirkliston Park. Our house was right at the bottom of the street and we had an acre of land around it. One side of the land ran alongside the old railway track or the Greenway as it's known today. And there were lots of trees along that side, but there was no fence. This meant that we were burgled on several occasions because it was easy to get to the house and it was easy to escape. One particular robbery was committed by our neighbor's sons. A neighbor whom my mum was very friendly with and who had supported our family in all sorts of ways. My mum never pressed charges against the boys, but the neighbor never looked my mum in the eye again. She walked away from the friendship because of the shame that she felt. Their relationship was broken and my mum was bereft. She didn't want the relationship severed but the neighbor felt too much shame to allow it to continue. Shame can act, um, cause us to act and react towards people in ways that they can't understand because sometimes they are not aware of what we have done that is resulting in our shame. For example, in November 2022, the fourth most popular destination on the web was Pornhub. It was visited by 10.2 billion times. It was visited that amount of times, 10.2 billion times. And 97% of the traffic came from mobile devices. A hidden pleasure, a hidden addiction, a hidden source of shame that stops us looking people in the eye and causes us to withdraw from those that we love without them knowing the reasons why. And one reason is that we're afraid of what they will think and how they will respond. Adam and Eve hid from God when they heard him walking in the garden because of their fear. They knew that, sorry, this is not working very well. So can we put this one on? Sorry. They knew that they had broken God's command. They knew that they now felt differently towards each other and towards God. Like a parent who already knows the answers, God asked them three questions. Where are you? Who told you that you were naked? What is this that you have done? These questions show God's patience desire in giving the humans the opportunities to own their failures. A loving parent always gives a child an opportunity to own up to what they have done. He knew where they were. He knew how they knew they were naked. He knew what they had done. But he wanted them to acknowledge their violation of his demand, divine command. But the image bearers evaded his questions every step of the way. How many times have you done this? Evading questions of a loved one because of the shame and guilt that you feel? Watching their emotions cross their face, frustration, anger, hurt, as they conclude that you are not being honest with them and they don't know why. Our shame and guilt will hamper our relationship with someone we love. And more importantly, it will hamper our relationship with our Heavenly Father. The three created creatures in this story, Adam, Eve, and the serpent, should not be seen as individuals involved in a personal crisis in their own story. Rather, 
They're representations of us all. This is our story. The mournful melody of shame and fear not only twists its way through the pages of the Bible in the characters and the nations that we meet, but it's also through the history of mankind. The three participants are the head of their race. The serpent on one hand and the man and the woman on the other. As a result of what they have done, God now speaks to each of them in turn and the resulting judgment impacts you and it impacts me. First he turns to the serpent. He had no right to be in the garden. He had no right to use the gift that God had given him to manipulate God's image bearers. So God curses him. And what he says next in 315 is the central melody of the symphony that is repeated again and again and again throughout the Bible. And it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This needs careful examination to fully appreciate what God is proclaiming. First he states, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Whatever the future holds for both the serpent and the woman, they're now on opposite sides of the battle both them and their offspring. The seed of the serpent in the continued story are those who turn from God and place themselves on the thrones of their own hearts. For example, those who were destroyed in the flood, those who tried to make themselves gods by building the Tower of Babel. The seed of the woman are those who try but often failed to follow God, Noah, Abraham. The second part of the verse states, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Notice that a singular personal pronoun is used. He, a single individual person will crush the head of the serpent. The final crushing deadly blow is not dispensed to the offspring of the serpent, but to the serpent himself. The question must be asked, who is he that will deliver this deadly blow? But the purpose of 315 is not to answer that question, but to raise it, to introduce us to the melody that flows throughout the remainder of the Bible and weaves its way around Messiah-like figures such as Noah, Moses, David, until we finally reach the climax of the symphony on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. The seed of the woman who defeats the serpent is Jesus. Paradoxically, it's Jesus' death that gives freedom to the rest of the offspring of the woman who are under the rule of the serpent. And it's Jesus' resurrection that breaks the curse of death. God then turns to the woman. Neither the man nor the woman are cursed as they are God's image bearers, but there are consequences for their actions. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, what's interesting in this verse is that the Hebrew word for grief or pain 
is the same word that God uses in verse 17 to refer to the painful toil that the man will experience when working the ground, matching and linking the two punishments. This particular word is used to describe emotional pain and the pain involved in work. The well-established Hebrew vocabulary, which is routinely used to describe labor pain, is absent. Therefore, we could deduce that this verse is referring to the agony, hardship, worry, and anxiety of the circumstances in which children are conceived, born, and raised. This sorrowful melody is repeatedly found in the Abrahamic family. Beginning with Sarah, three generations of women have fertility problems. Their children fight and plot against each other and ultimately their schemes split and defied families. And this sad melody is woven throughout the scriptures and throughout the history of humanity. Infertility is still a problem that causes great distress to many couples. Anyone who has raised children knows that it is difficult and full of hardship and anxiety. The consequences of the woman's actions has affected all of us. The second part of the verse you desire, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you is not meant to be interpreted as a positive ideal statement. This is a consequence of their disobedience, a sad inversion of what God had put in place in the garden. The man ruling the woman is the precise opposite of what God's ideal was in Genesis 1 and 2, where male and female rule together and where the woman is set apart from the animals, not as man's inferior, but as his equal. But now that alignment has shifted. The relationship between the man and the woman has changed. Not only do they feel vulnerable in each other's company, But the man will now relate to her as if she were part of creation, something to rule over, rather than a co-ruler over creation with him. As one commentator states, intended for partnership, they will in fact find themselves embroiled in a struggle for dominance. This is why family life will be more painful for the woman. Dysfunction now marks not only the human relationship with God and with the land, but also with each other. The curse of the land is placed upon Adam. God said to him, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. No longer will they enjoy a supply of bountiful food. It will take hard, painful work to gain enough to survive. And just as God promised, Abraham is told that he will return to dust. He will die. Death was never the plan for God's image bearers. They lived in the garden containing the tree of life. They were never told that they couldn't eat from it. But as soon as they ate from the tree of knowledge, they were expelled from the garden because the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Adam's genealogy in chapter 5 is unique. 
as at the end of each generation it is written, and he died, and he died, and he died. And so it goes on until we reach Noah and his sons. The author is reminding us of the consequences of Abraham's disobedience on the following generations. Adam and Eve received their own judgment from God, yet the results of their punishments affected both of them and all mankind. Their relationship was no longer harmonious, but fraught with tension and difficulties. Adam suffered the agony and hardship of family life. Eve worked hard on the land and ultimately died just like her husband. And the curse of nature brought into creation all kinds of illnesses and disabilities causing suffering to both. But we mustn't forget, chapter three doesn't end on a sorrowful tune. Before God sends them out of the garden, he's gracious to them. Fig leaves will not do as clothing. So God provides them with garments. But to do this, the first death occurs. The first blood is spilt. Animals are used for their skins as garments for the couple. Another melody has been introduced into the symphony. The image bearers have sinned against God. And as a result, only he can provide suitable covering for them. And the shedding of blood, the new melody, is a necessary part of the process. Hebrews 9 and 22 says, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood... There is no forgiveness. As offspring of Adam and Eve, we too have rebelled against God by living for ourselves and not for him. We too have been banished from the garden and from the presence of God. We cannot stand before God as we are. But the melody that began in Genesis, proclaiming that a single seed would crush the serpent has already been fulfilled. We live in a post-resurrection world. The serpent has been defeated. His head has been crushed. Jesus, God in human form, willingly died for us. On the cross, he spilt his blood for us, to cleanse us from our sins. His death permits us to put on Jesus' righteousness as a garment once we have sought forgiveness, making us acceptable to God and allowing us to come in to his presence. Isaiah 61 and 10, part of that melody that points to the future says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. By living in the post-resurrection world, we live in what is known as the now and the not yet meaning that the kingdom of God is here on earth right now. And if you're a child of God, you live within it. But it also has yet to come in all of its fullness. As we live in this interim time, the kingdom of God to come is our future hope. It is a day when the scripture tells us that all things will be made new. And every tear will be wiped away from the face of the broken hearted. I know 
that there are many people sitting here today who are suffering from bereavement, illness, mental health difficulties, addiction, cancer, and perhaps even suicidal thoughts. Life is difficult. And sometimes it can feel relentless as the waves of suffering crash into us time and time and time again. We're not promised a life free from suffering when we become a Christian, but we are given hope of a future where there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. But while we live on earth, waiting for this to come, we can be reassured that God holds us when we cry, that he lifts our heads and he looks into our eyes and he tells us that he loves us. He holds out his hands and he pulls us from that deep pit that we cannot get out of ourselves. That he's right beside us, even when we feel that he is far away. Yet this is only guaranteed to those who live in God's kingdom on earth. If you are not part of God's kingdom, then you're not part of God's story. You're living under the rule of the serpent. Only guaranteed death, rejection from God, and a lack of hope. But God's spirit invites you today to leave that kingdom and to enter into his story to make it your story so that you can also live in the reassuring presence of God now and forever. Let's just take a few moments of silence to reflect upon the words that we've heard this morning. Heavenly Father, as your Holy Spirit speaks to us this morning, help us to respond to his prompting. Amen. Let's now stand and sing, His Mercy is More.
in a moment or two, we're going to sing again, and then Dan's going to come and lead us in our prayers. For others, I just want to mention a few uh, announcements. First of all, just things to bring to your attention uh, this morning. Uh, first of all, on uh, Wednesday night, we're starting a new uh, a new thing. We're, we're taking a break this term from our normal DG program. What we want you to do is want you to all come together uh, here to our church hall. We're going to spend some time uh, being together uh, as part of our different DGs, being together, uh, sharing in prayer together, creative prayer, and, and listening to God, uh, and, and helping and supporting and, and caring for one another. And the whole idea is of us taking this time uh, in a new chapter in our church's life to rest in Christ and also to prepare us for a new season when, um, if things go uh, as we hope they will, uh, in a little while we'll be out of this building. We will be doing things differently for a time. Uh, we want to prepare ourselves for that and listen for where God might be leading us in that. Uh, and so we want to take the time to do that together. And so that will be starting this Wednesday night, the 11th of September, and it will it will continue the next Thursday night. We're doing it sort of alternately Wednesday and Thursday, or sorry, two weeks' time the Thursday night. So 11th of September, then the 26th of September, and it'll continue in that pattern through the autumn term. We're doing that to make it as available as possible for those who maybe can't make a Wednesday night uh, to be able to come on a Thursday night. But we want as many as folks as possible to come and to share in that together, praying together, uh, being led together, listening together for God's Spirit as we spend that time together. So that's uh, on when, starting on Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. We'd love you to be part of that. And if you're not currently part of a DG, you are very warmly invited to be part of that process as well. So please do come along Wednesday at 8 o'clock as we start that together. Uh, also, just to mention something to correct from the, uh, the newsletter that went out, Nurture does not start this week. Nurture's our women's Bible study uh, that happens on a Wednesday morning. It's not starting this week but on the 18th of September, so next Wednesday rather than this Wednesday for Nurture. Also, as usual this morning, and if you're visiting with us or you're new with us, please do stay for tea, coffee, uh, and buns. And there are buns this morning. There are, uh, is an extra special element to this morning. There are some lovely buns from uh, Shirley's coffee morning yesterday. Uh, so please do come and share in those. And if you would like to as well, please donate. There's a little basket here for donations uh, to uh, Essential Life-Saving Skills for Africa, which is the group that Shirley is going out to South Sudan with later in the month. So please do come and share uh, in that together this morning. Uh, a couple of uh, announcements to do with our community in particular. Um, uh, one is to do with uh, our schools. Actually, they're both to do with schools. Uh, our boards of governors of our local schools, that's Greenwood, Belmont, Dundella, and Strandtown, we have the right to appoint uh, governors to those bodies uh, called transferers, representatives. I'll not go into the detail of how that came about, but we have the right to do that, and it's an important right that we take up as uh, churches in this area. Currently, there's a, a reformulation of those boards of governors happening, uh, and we really want to take up our places on those different boards. So if you feel that's something you would like to be involved in, maybe in the past you've been a parents governor or you've been uh, an education authority governor or something like that, if you'd like to take that opportunity up uh, in any of our schools, please speak to myself or to Gareth Irwin about that. And also in relation to schools, Scripture Union Northern Ireland uh, work in our schools across East Belfast, and they have a schools district support team uh, for their schools worker, uh, and they would be interested to know if anybody in Kirkpatrick would, be, would like to be involved in that support team. They particularly need help uh, in the finance end of things, and they need a secretary as part of that group as well. But, if you, but anyone who is interested at all in Scripture Union schools work, and I know that is a lot of people in this congregation, please do speak to me about that. We would love to be able to be, play a part as a congregation on that team as well. Last uh, thing I need to announce this morning is to remind folks uh, of some funeral details that are happening this week. Last week in church, we announced uh, the death of Mr. Desmond McKibben, and his Thanksgiving service will take place on Saturday morning uh, here in the church at 11 o'clock uh, and then after the service on last Sunday, um, we were saddened to learn of the death of Mrs. Betty Hunter. Uh, Betty's uh, funeral service will take place at 12 noon on Tuesday, this Tuesday coming. Uh, and that will be in Malone Presbyterian Church where one of her daughters worships uh, and is involved in worship leading. So that's uh, 
12 noon on Tuesday in Malone Presbyterian Church for Betty Hunter's funeral service and then Desmond McKibben's service here in church at 11 o'clock on Saturday. And please do continue to hold those families in your prayers. We're going to continue in worship uh, as we uh, sing together our next song, How Deep the Father's Love. And during this uh, song, our offering will be collected. If you're visiting with us or you're new to us, you're not obliged to contribute to the offering if you want to do so. That's absolutely fine. But we're going to lift that offering uh, as we sing How Deep the Father's Love. We're now going to take some time to pray for others. Uh, it's a time for service when we take an opportunity for us all to pray together uh, for the world around us and also for the community here that we've been placed in. We'll be praying for our church family here in Kirkpatrick um, using some of the points in Graham's email this week um, for global mission and for opportunities for each of us to share the truth of Jesus with those who don't know him yet. Let's pray together. Father God, you are a good God who is above all things, and you are in complete control. Help us to remember that now as we bring these things before you in prayer. We pray for the life of this church as we consider the next steps, both in our building project and in our wider ministry as a congregation in Ballyhackamore. Please give us courage and wisdom, and we ask that you be glorified 
that your kingdom would be advanced and people in our church and community would be pointed to Jesus. We ask that you would bless our midweek times of prayer this term as we take a break from our usual format of discipleship groups and that these times of prayer and listening will deepen our relationships both with one another and with you. Please mold us to be more like Jesus and give us a heart for the things that you love. We pray again for Seth, Bodhi and their families and also for Reese, Alexa and Martha as they get baptized this afternoon. We pray that you would fill them with your spirit, that they would know your love, your grace and peace as they follow Jesus each day. We also continue to pray for the families of Desmond McKibben and Betty Hunter as they grieve and prepare for funerals this week. Would they find comfort in a God who knows them intimately and who cares for them deeply? We pray for Shirley as she travels to South Sudan later this month to provide such important and life saving health care training. Please bless that work and may you be glorified through it. We pray too for the work of all in our congregation involved with mission organizations, including IFES, InterServe, Children of the Nations, Young Life, and Home for Good. And Father God, we want to pray for those in our city, in our community who do not know you. We ask that you will move and reveal yourself to many, that they will realize their need of you and come to call you their Lord and Savior. We pray that you will use us in this mission, giving us opportunities to share your word with those we interact with day in and day out. Give us a deep hunger to see those closest to us come to a deep and transforming faith in Christ. And we take a minute now to think of specific people in our lives that we want to bring before you. Father God, thank you that you hear our prayers. Amen. We're going to stand now and sing our final hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever. And all God's people say, Amen.